Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries. Um, this is the uh, preface of the uh, Judas Scepter and Joseph's Birthright book. Uh, wow. You know, what's really sad is this is a library, well, it's a copy of a library book. A copy of a library book they actually took it and photocopied it and printed the thing um, in basically 10 years no I take that back in about 12 years this book had been checked out 10 times yeah can you imagine that in over 10 years checked out 10 times unbelievable so yeah it's a shame well we were warned about a great falling away and we're there preface <clears throat> because of our connection with a certain school of christian thought we once held the erroneous opinion that most of the prophecies of the old testament were fulfilled and that its present use was simply to feed the faith of devout men. Also that any nourishment for faith, which could be drawn from that source, was not wholesome food for the soul, unless we were in possession of such an exalted type of spirituality that we should be able to rise above the somewhat prosy details of its histories and find our soul food in a surely accompanying spiritual influence, which in its action upon us was superior to the mere literalness of the subject matter. We were also led to suppose that the unfulfilled prophecies of Moses and the prophets were of no special moment to Christianity because the great momentous question, the coming of a Savior, was settled forever. Consequently, when perchance we found some prophetic utterance therein we were forced to admit had not to had, which had not become a historic ver, ver, variety v-e-r-i-t-y ver i don't know i gotta look that word up <clears throat> uh, i pronounced it wrong verity noun a true principle or belief especially one of fundamental importance um truth irrefutable objective um yeah something like that the quality or state of being true or real uh okay let's go back to uh, consequently when perchance we find some prophetic utterance therein which we were forced to admit had not become a historic verity and since this was the dispensation of the spirit, we felt at liberty to give the reins of our somewhat vivid imaginations and let it run unchecked through the verdant and fruitful fields of speculation in search of some rare and deeply spiritual truth which we might, which we might lay against the seeming rhetorical figure of Holy Writ. But this roaming through those alluring fields always resulted in failure for when those fanciful and random conjectures no matter how lofty were brought before our quickened conscience they were soon condemned because that judge who sits at the bar of our spiritual integrity not only revealed their insincerity but also convinced us that they did not contain the real import thought and purpose for which those words of God were written. Thus defeated, we could only bemoan our lack, not only of the mental power to grasp the true meaning of those holy words, but also the depth of spirituality, which was supposed to be essential to the possession of that intense spiritual power, which could pierce through the density of earthly things into the rarity of those which were heavenly. For the spiritual standards which we had erected for ourselves demanded the attainment of a soul life which would give us power to soar in the 
spirit into such rarefied heights of divine enlightenment that we could discern the grace curves, the symmetrical outlines, the non-earthly shadows, the heavenly halftones, and divine highlights of that wonderful picture, that spiritual masterpiece which lay behind the coarseness of the letter. These errors so blinded us that in our ignorance we even considered that the twelve apostles whom our Lord had chosen and enlightened were in gross error when they understand when they understood Christ and the scriptures to teach that there was to be a literal literal and visible kingdom of God on the earth with the Lord as king of all the earth when that day came. We assume that their conception of the promised kingdom, when contrasted with our own, was carnal in the extreme. And that the superiority of our conception lay in the fact that it was free from all moral, mortal, mortal grossness. And we really thought that the spirit of moral groveling among the apostles had reached its climax when James, who afterward became a martyr, when James, who afterward became a martyr, and his brother John, he whom the master loved, took their mother to Christ and had her make request of him for the, for them which they did not make which they did not dare make for themselves but thank god such conceptions of divine truth were were only our spiritual swaddling clothes and the daydreams of spiritual babyhood for as we grew in grace and became less presumptive, the Holy Ghost lifted the veil from our mind and illuminated the following portion of the Savior's reply to the request of the mother of James and John, to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them to whom it is prepared of my Father. In this work, we have followed the history of the two families or kingdoms into which the seed of Abraham were divided through the intricate paths of their biblical history and their prophecies concerning them, which have thus uh, which have thus far become history down to the present day without the loss of any single connecting link. We have been moved by the Holy uh, Spirit to thus write concerning the earthly history of God's chosen race, because so very little of it is known to the masses of our people, and yet it is the foundation upon which the entire structure of Christianity must rest. Hmm. A knowledge of these earthly things not only renders the claims of Christianity impregnable, but they are also the basis upon which we must rest our faith for better things. For Jesus has said, quote, If I have told you of earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Unquote. The truth of this saying of the Lord has been demonstrated in our own ministry, for in the last seven years, during which time we have been able to demonstrate the special features of truth as set forth in this book, i.e., the realization of the promises made to Israel by the people of Israel. The Lord has used us to bring more skeptics to the light of this truth than in all our previous ministry of 21 years. Also during the seven years, while we have been, uh, while we have seen the faith of some fall, the Lord have, has helped us to save the tottering faith of many. We are also sure from the very reasons which are given that the faith of those who have made shipwreck could not have failed. If if they had known these things. Hence we have written this time concerning the earthen things which are the subjects of divine inspiration, praying that God will use them to strengthen the faith of some and to bring others into the faith in the inspiration of the Bible. But if there seems to be a demand for it, we will write again, and then we will write on the heavenly things. And that, everybody, is the end of the preface. Now, what is a preface? Um, quoting from someplace, I copied this a while back, but I don't remember who the author is. A preface is best understood 
I believe, as standing outside the book proper and being about the book. In a preface, an author explains briefly why they wrote the book or how they came to write it. They also often use the preface to establish their credibility, indicating their experience in the topic or their professional, professional suitability to address such a topic. Sometimes they acknowledge those who inspired them or helped them, though these are often put into a separate acknowledgement section. Using an old term from the study of rhetoric, a preface is in a sense an apology, an explanation, or defense. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, apology comes from a Greek word and it means to give an answer. So, and that's in uh, 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer, give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. So, uh, there's a special uh, type of Bible studies, which they call uh, apologetics. And that has reference to the Greek word where you're not apologizing for your faith. No, you're giving an answer. But that's where they get the word apology from. Apologia, I think it's called. I'd have to look it up. You know, there's a lot of English words that come from uh, Greek. A lot. So, you know, people think... Uh, they don't think it matters, but it does. But we're supposed to give an answer. Yeah, how come you're all you're happy all the time? That's because I know Christ loves me. It should be a you know. But uh, basically, if you were like a guy named Kent Hoven that would fight uh, evolution or evil Lucian, as some call it. Um, he is involved in the area called uh, apologetics. And no, he's not apologizing for being a Christian. But uh, that's what, uh, like if you were defending the King James Bible, opposed to the NIV, uh, that would be another form of apologetics, I guess you could say. I don't know. You know, I I don't like I, I don't uh, I don't like getting involved in all that stuff. You know, I, I like just to, to, to keep it on layman's terms and you know you know, all these people with their doctorate degrees, they can all talk about their eschatology and soteriology and use all these big fancy uh, $20 words to try to impress each other, but I think it's a bunch of garbage. You know, lawyers and doctors do all that so they can justify uh, charging you $180 for three minutes of your time. You know, I'm not like that. And uh, I might know what this stuff means, but does it, does it edify Christ? You know? Uh, no, it doesn't. And I'm one of those people believe uh, believes in keep it simple, stupid. And I'm the king. Yeah. Keep it simple, stupid. And I'm right there. So, uh, and by no means do I claim to have it all figured out. When I do, I'll let you know. Maybe in a thousand years, but uh, not right now. Alrighty, uh, I can't believe I'm still sick. Oh boy, unbelievable. Alrighty, uh, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.